Assalamu alaikum. Today is our uh, lecture number eight of global business management. The topic of today's lecture is uh, foreign direct investment. The main learning objectives of today's lectures is identify the focus, underpinning, uh, under identify the forces ad underpinning the rising tide of foreign direct investment in the world economy. This is the first objective. The second objective is understand why firms often prefer direct investments as a strategy for entering foreign market or alternatives such as exporting or granting foreign entities the right to produce product under license. I mean, we are going to uh, understand that, we are going to discuss this concept that why firms are preferring FDI over export or licensing. The third objective is understand the importance of location for FDI. I mean, what is the importance where and how firms choose location when they decide to invest somewhere outside the country. Okay, this is the, uh, before we start the today's lecture, uh, we uh, do the quick uh, recap of the last lecture. Last lecture was uh, primarily focused on the theories and we had uh, discussed the theories of uh, Hechler uh, Ohlin theory, um, Leontief paradox, product life cycle, new trade theory and the Porter's diamond. These are the four or five uh, concepts we had discussed and uh, important intention with the discussion was to understand and uh, theoretically what is the uh, to what is the trade flow and which theory best explain the trade flow across the countries first of all we had discussed the assumptions of compet uh, competitive advantage theory comparative advantage theory the simple example of comparative advantage makes a number of assumptions I mean we had discussed this thing that the uh, Comparative advantage theory discussed on um, that's a really uh, that was a really important chapter that uh, describes all the uh, related theories for international business. That's why I really emphasize on that chapter and I really f uh, stress you guys stress that uh, you guys should read that chapter really carefully and listen. Uh, those uh, recordings of uh, those lecture seven and six very carefully because this is the base of this whole course. And okay, uh, f we had discussed in the in the lecture number six we had discussed lecture six and seven we we continuously we discussed the example of uh, two the two countries of Ghana and uh, South Korea and we tried to explain the concept of absolute advantage and comparative advantage with the help of uh, the, the, that example. And uh, but important thing was, and the, the, this is the main important thing that uh, Ricardo in comparative advantage theory, Ricardo used that example and, uh, and he made several exam ex uh, assumptions when he proposed that theory. The basic assumptions underlying that theory was uh, uh, there were only two countries. The first one is the two countries involved and the two goods were involved. This is the first thing. Important thing is these cons these assumptions are not uh, totally right in the real world. We like there are uh, the assumption is saying that there are only two countries involved in the trade. In fact, there are not two countries. There are plenty of countries who can make trade with each other. And the second thing was uh, there are only two products involved in trade. Of co in reality, of course, this um, assumption also fails in the real world. There are plenty of products uh, which are uh, which can be swapped across the countries. Z the next one is zero transaction cost. Zero transaction cost also uh, doesn't hold 
in the real world of course when the countries are ex uh, exporting and importing with e from each other of course there is a transaction cost and transaction cost means it costs money for them to import or export the product in in transportation cost uh, the location of the country is very important if the country is situated very close to that that country or very neighboring country then the tra cost transportation cost will be low otherwise transportation cost will be really high uh, high factor uh, in similar prices and the values the next point was that uh, the prices are similar across the countries again this this assumption doesn't uh, is also uh, false in the real world prices is really difficult for firms or in fact it's impossible for firms to hold the same prices across the countries because the cost of production is different across the countries and the values are different we preferences of the products in the market are different across the countries resources are mobile between goods within countries this is one another thing that resources are mobile between goods mean uh, within countries mean within country like we had discussed the example that countries can move the product initially what they were doing when they are focusing only on the production of um, fo fo focusing on both products and they are producing both products but later on what they were doing they are spe they are focusing or they are they are producing only the specialized product while doing so they are moving away all the resources whatever the limited resources they have and in that example they had the 200 unit of resources they are moving away all those 200 resources from one product to another where they are more specialty in production but in fact when they are in in reality when the companies move their resources from one product to another it costs money it costs them money to shift or move these resources from one product to another and the second next thing is uh, constant return to scale again we if if we consider this thing in real world uh, uh, li like in that example initially they were producing sm uh, small amount of both products and then later on they were focusing on their special uh, specialty and they were producing only the one product in reality when the companies do this thing uh, when they are producing at a higher at uh, the larger number then of course the economy of scale concept arises economy of scale means when the uh, the level of production increases of course the cost unit cost of that product decreases and this in that ricardo's ricardo's um, model this concept is also absent fixed cost of resources mean again the cost of resources are considered as fixed which is again false and no effects on income distribution within the countries which is also not not true in the real world the next one uh, that we had discussed the samuelson critique samuelson argued that resources do not always move freely from one econ economic activity to another like we had discussed the ability to offshore the services jobs that were traditionally not intentionally mobile may have effect of mass inward migration into the united states where wages would then fall okay because of this trade overall overall new migration new people highly skilled people or low skill blue collar job will come into the usa and uh, might be immigrant people they will demand the low wages and the overall industry the low low wage standard will be set within the us the next thing is the studies exploring the relationship between a trade and economic growth suggest that the country that have the more open mean countries they have the more open policies for trade they are more benefited from the trade it, to what extent they are getting benefit they are benefit in terms of increasing of their stock of resources this is the first advantage when the foreign trade foreign capital is coming in the country the level of stock is increases level of resources are increases the second one is uh, the, uh, the trade increases the efficiency in terms of how the trade in uh, increases the efficiency and in, in efficiency eventually increases the overall growth of the country this is the concept mean how the trade increases the efficiency mean uh, it in trade increases the efficiency in terms of technology first of all when the multinational companies entering in the market they are bringing with them a new technology second thing is 
they are there is a spillover effect I mean because of this new technology their domestic firms are also get also learning new skills new technology from those multinational firms this is the first thing second thing the third thing is because of competition because of these multinational firms the level of competition will be increased in the domestic market and the domestic firms were forced to invent new products or in increase their quality or reduce their products efficiency will be increased and the the third thing is economy of scale when the uh, the companies are coming in the market the level of production will be higher people demand will be higher level of production will be higher the overall cost will be reduced so overall the efficiency within the market will be higher the next point is hecksher and hollins hollins the swedish guys they propose that the competitive advantage arises from differences in national factor endowments and endowment we should consider the endowment mean this uh, the bless blessing thing endowment we should consider when the, when we talk about the endowment we should consider the endowment in terms of relative terms not in absolute term in 1953 later on this uh, leontov postulated that since the us was relatively abundant in capital compared to other nations the us would be an exporter of the capital intensive goods Uh, and an importer of labor intensive goods however he found that us exports more, were less capital inten intensive than the us imports the I mean, important point of leontov uh, theory was like this in uh, is like this that the people, the companies uh, the countries should focus on their positive uh, their strongholds their uh, uh, their where they are more efficient in production they are focus they should focus on those products and they he suggested that the on the basis of this concept following this on the ba on the basis of this theory this notion us should uh, us should uh, export more capital intensive goods and they should import labor in import labor intensive because the labor of the us was more expensive and that's why U us have to import the labor intensive products such products which require more labor us shouldn't produce those things rather than they have to import those products but what he observed while uh, while while doing that this study he observed he Uh, studied the export or import pattern of the US uh, across several uh, decades and he 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 found that the US is exporting less capital intensive and US is importing more labor intensive products this is the this is the opposite what he proposed what he su suspected that's why this is considered a uh, leontov uh, paradox But the only rationale that uh, the uh, scholars could provide uh, in um, in answering the leontov paradox is that why us is import exporting uh, labor in, why us is exporting labor intensive product was like this that might be these products which uh, what leontov has ex uh, observed was the high tech products in high tech products uh, more in innovative products like the computer products the semiconductor products or this uh, laptops or these cameras or this sort of things the digital things and uh, the, the the these scholars are arguing because these pro production of these products require uh, highly skilled people and more uh, technical require more technical knowledge and therefore and considering us is blessed with this factor us has more technical uh, technical highly uh, highly skilled people and uh, people with the technical know how and that's why us is exporting those things later on mid in in mid 60s uh, vernon proposed the product life cycle he according to this cycle that uh, uh, as the product matures the location of sale and location of product will change this is the important thing and because of this with the with the passage of time uh, the uh, flow of uh, flow and direction of trade trade will change and while explaining this thing he he explained this concept with the um, with the help of uh, example of xerox companies photocopier machine he said that in the beginning in the mid 60s 
Xerox company they in invented the photocopier machine in USA and later on they uh, in initially they were uh, just selling within the US subsequently in they started to export uh, export in the EU market this is the first thing the first step they did in subsequently when this observed that the uh, demand within the EU market is higher of this photocopy machine they they start they install the production unit in EU in Europe and they started to produce the uh, photocopy machine in Europe and selling in the European market later subsequently uh, European companies are absorbed that technology and started to produce their own photocopier machine and serve the European market um, in that point the important thing was the com the competition is uh, there was some competition and the, uh, the uh, survival of those companies lies in the cost of that product whoever is selling cheaper is more successful later on what happened that uh, this product uh, these European company and US market they went out in the developing countries and they uh, to sell their products and they observed the demand in those markets and and uh, they starting to export the product from Europe and from USA to those th uh, third world countries from developing countries and subsequently one day what they observed that the uh, when they are selling the product in third world country they start they started their uh, production unit in third world country as well and uh, and they were uh, uh, catering the third world market uh, while producing from there uh, from in the third world market as well the important concept arises there is uh, from production in third world countries USA started to import the pro photocopier machine from third world country to US rather than producing in USA they were importing the, the, though the same photocopier machine from third world countries to USA the important concept is with the passage of time as the product matures the location of production first it was in USA then in Europe then third world country location of the factory changes similarly the sale of the product changes as well I mean we can say that sale of the product changes from USA Europe and third world and parallelly the production of production uh, location of production is also changes mean we can say that with the passage of time as the product matures the location sale and the production changes with the passage of time like an important uh, important problem with this philosophy is there that it assumes that the, all the production will start from the USA again as we see that in the uh, t the color TV is invented in Japan how can they explain this this invention or uh, this product product life cycle of TV how can they explain with this uh, theory and the second one is like laptop laptop introduced all over the world at the same time they cannot explain the uh, product life cycle of laptop with this theory uh, in order to answer this thing that oh, oh, uh, answer people people were people the scholars uh, uh, keep searching the answer of the these this sort of question and they propose the economy of scale concept first mover advantage and a pattern of trade first mover advantage is wherever the firms go first they get the competitive advantage and they stop uh, they create some obst such obstacles which uh, hinders new entrants to enter in the market and uh, like we can see the and important this concept is more applicable in such markets where the demand is low demand is limited like in uh, aircraft industry the last one is the porters uh, porters of, of uh, for forces like the, the he proposed a diamond uh, in uh, to explain the trade flow according to these these diamond he proposed the four factors where he's saying these four factors are the main factors which uh, uh, provide firms a competitive advantage the first factor is first uh, in fact what he, the porter did he combined all the previous theories and put these theories here uh, to uh, sum up this his uh, uh, theory and he said that factor endowment is the f was the first factor the second one is that demand conditions the third one is relating and supporting industry the fourth one is firm strategy structure and rivalry okay now we are, we are going to talk about the assignment this is the assignment number one that you have to provide Mercantilism is a bank uh, bankrupt theory. 
uh, mercantilism bankrupt theory that has no place in the modern world briefly explain your answer and the second question is unions in developed nations often oppose imports from low wage countries and advoc uh, advocate trade barriers to protect jobs from what they often characterize as unfair import uh, competition is is such competition unfair do you think that this argument is in the best interest of unions the people they represent the country as a whole the three stakeholders how you how you think that this these import or this argument is unfair argument is uh, best suited for the in are in the interest of the unions or people they represent or the country as a whole the second one is the, is there is a difference between the transference of high paying uh, white collar jobs such as computer programming and accounting to developing nations and how paying blue collar jobs if so what is the difference and what should government do anything to stop the flow of white collar jobs out of the country to countries like india you may provide you uh, you may provide your suggestion in bl bullet points and the critical thinking question was the world's poorest countries are at the competitive disadvantage in every sector of their economies they have little to export they have no capital their land is of poor quality they often have too many people given available work opportunities and they are poorly educated these are the factors they are facts that the uh, develop, developing countries have free trade cannot possibly be in the interest of such nations you can discuss these questions you can think about this question or and you can discuss this question with your friends with your colleagues and this is the question that uh, might be you are observing these things around you and uh, um, you can you can you can think about it and you can apply these theories you can think in the perspective of theories how these theories help you to answer this question the important uh, management focus the rise of finland's nokia we are going to discuss this thing this is the uh, the small case study of nokia uh, from finland and uh, uh, the case study the detail of this case study is available in the chapter number 6 of book hill the details of that book is provided in the course outline the the quick summary of this uh, case study is as follows this feature is about the growth of the cellular telephone equipment industry and more specifically about the rise in competitiveness of nokia a finnish cellular telephone company the feature explains the reasons that nokia was particularly well positioned to take advantage of the growth of global cellular telephone industry this feature explains nokia was a particular well position to take advantage of the growth of the global cellular network important thing that the important thing is that what are those advantages which uh, nokia had at that time to uh, avail the advantages uh, and uh, they they benefited from those uh, features those advantages and they captured the market the question that you had to think about or the you are going to discuss is the first one is using the new trade theory and porter's theory of national competitive advantage describe why nokia emerged as a leading competitor in the global cellular telephone industry equipment now you have to think about new trade theory porter's theory of national competitive advantage and uh, new trade theory may mean you can talk about you can think about the a uh, competitive advantage a uh, competitive advantage if, if a new mover uh, first mover advantage economy of scale advantage these are the things and in uh, porter's theory you have to uh, discuss about the, the four factors like endowment factors and the firm strategy and rivalry these are the factors that you have to think about when you are answering the um the, why nokia emerged as a leading competitor in the cellular industry the second question that you are going to explain is explain why the cellular telephone industry taught caught on in finland and the other scandinavian countries faster than the rest of the world 
why these countries were more uh, exp they experienced more growth in Scandinavian countries as compared to other countries this is the second question the third one is why didn't the development of the cellular telephone equipment industry take place in Mexico or other Central or South American country rather than Finland Sweden and United States base your answer of the international trade theories described in this chapter you are going to explain in terms of uh, in through the help of these uh, theories okay what is the meaning of FDI the first this is the first question that we are going to discuss that uh, in this uh, lecture foreign FDI mean foreign direct investment which occurs when a firm invests directly in new facilities to produce and or, or market in a foreign country this is the basic definition the firm becomes a multinational because of doing this thing this activity international activity firm becomes a multinational firm FDI can be in the form of greenfield investment okay F FDI greenfield investment what is the meaning of greenfield investment the establishment of a wholly new operation in in the foreign factory mean when a, fact a firm starts its business in another country from scratch from scratch mean uh, mean they they st start a new production unit they build the production unit and they from scratch to the final product all those things they make in that country that's called greenfield investments the next one in the next mode or next form of the FDI can be the acquisition or mergers uh, with existing firms in the foreign country this is the second way of doing FDI acquisitions or mergers acquisition uh, merger mean they are acquiring the f the firm in the foreign market the whole firm or half of it um, acquire mean the whole or entire firm or subsidiary they can acquire the second thing is merge they can they can uh, collaborate that firm and they produce the some some products uh, in collaboration with the domestic firm the flow of FDI refers to the amount of FDI undertaken over the given period of time these are the basic concepts uh, and these are the uh, terms might be you have heard around you or in the media newspaper you have heard this flow of FDI flow of FDI mean amount of foreign direct investment undertaken in a given year within the FD, FDI flow there are two types of term outward flow or inward flow outward flow mean outward f outward uh, out outward yeah outflow of FDI mean flow is going out of the com out of the country are the flows of FDI out of the country and inflows of FDI mean flows of FDI coming into the country the next term that is uh, important that uh, stock a uh, stock of FDI a stock of FDI mean refers to the total accumulated value of foreign owned assets at a given time stock of FDI again coming in the country or coming uh, going out of the country if if it's coming in the country it's referred to the ac accumulated value of foreign owned assets in in, in which uh, which entered in that country or which went out of that country okay what are the patterns of FDI both the flows and stocks stock of FDI have created over uh, over the last 30 years most FDI is targeted uh, towards developed nations United States and EU South okay important thing that we we need to understand is that uh, what was the flow of FDI FDI flow uh, have seen in in last third especially in the last 30 years in the flow of FDI were, were towards the developed nation industrialized nation like USA and the Europe and the Japan but lately we are observing the FDI flow from or towards the emerging economies like uh, Southeast Asia uh, China Latin American countries as well this is a new tr new pattern and why we why we are uh, observing this new pattern because of this 
uh, financial reforms or globalization or privatization or uh, structural reforms within those countries they uh, introduce the new regulations and they uh, because of those regulations they are encouraging firms to uh, perform the FDI uh, in those countries they in the governments are facilitating governments have such uh, made the policy ch change in policies which encourage FDI from those countries FDI has grown more rapidly than world trade and world output this is another important concept that FDI the rate of growth of FDI is higher than rate of growth of GDP around the world this is the most important thing firm still fear the threat of uh, protectionism despite these things despite this increase or uh, uh, that increment across in FDI across the globe firms are still fearing the threat uh, threat of pr uh, protectionism democratic political institutes and free market economies have encouraged FDI like we discussed that the dem democratic political institutions I mean uh, like we we already discussed this thing that uh, uh, y y uh, the collapse of yes, the Soviet Union the breakup of Soviet Union uh, the uh, countries uh, have now the new democratic institutions which encourage the FDI and because of this new institutions and new policies these countries are considered as uh, transition countries the former Soviet Union states and the free market economies have encouraged econ FDI the globalization is forcing firms to maintain a presence around the world this is another thing why we are experiencing why we are observing the, a lot of FDI the, because of the globalization globalization mean that uh, this concept the firms are going around the around the world and they are facing intense competition to uh, if they are trying if they are staying only one country one country or one market it become really difficult for them to uh, to survive in that market what they have to do they have to explore the other market other growth opportunities as well in order to do so they are going move they are going abroad in other countries to find the growth opportunities the next point is the next uh, is growth gross fixed capital formation that which is total amount of capital invested in uh, factories stores office building like other I mean this is the sort of FDI which is done only in the fixed assets uh, I mean other countries uh, other companies are coming into the country and they are going into the another country but they are investing only in the factories stores or office building this is important thing. and this is considered as gross fixed capital formation the greater the capital investment in an economy the more favorable its future prospects are likely to be of course the uh, when the uh, more trade is coming in or going out of that country the overall GDP and the growth is will be higher in that country and uh, the why uh, and uh, why and the relationship between trade and growth economic growth has been discussed in the last lecture so FDI is an important source of capital investment and determinants of future growth rate of the economy this is the important concept FDI is considered as a, as a important source of capital investment and determinant of future growth rate of the economy why has there been such a significant increase in FDI flow there are several reasons for this I mean why we are observing a, a sudden surge of um, multinational companies going around the world there are four reasons the first one is firms are worried about the uh, protectionist measures and see FDI a way of getting around trade barriers I mean important thing is countries are protecting their market through trade barriers trade barriers are more applicable in export or importing and to overcome the import and export barriers firms are changing their uh, trade pattern and trade mode and they are switching from import export mode to FDI mode that's why the, it is stated that FDI is a way of getting around the trade barriers 
The second thing is changes in the economic and the political policies of many countries have opened new markets to investment, like uh, in, in uh, the ch political changes around the world, and the countries are opening up from Kuma and they are shifting from command economy to the market economies, and they are providing the opportunities, and they are welcoming the uh, the companies from the other countries and this this whole scenario is is this change scenario is is welcoming firms or encouraging firms to go out and explore the glow growth opportunities in those countries think for example the changes in eastern europe like we had discussed the uh, after the collapse of soviet union the eastern bloc is uh, liberated and have made it possible for foreign firms to expand there the third point is many firms see the world as their market now and so are expanding wherever they feel it makes sense. Sp for instance, Spain's Telefonica is pursuing opportunities in Latin America and in Europe. I mean, wherever firms are observing, they are seeing this thing that there are some opportunities. They, are just, they just go for, uh, for those opportunities. Many manufacturing are expanding into foreign countries to take advantage of lower cost of labor or to be closer to the customers and on and so on. China has become the hotspot of the firm that are attra attra attracted to the country's low wage rates and large market. In part, there are two concepts. The first one is the uh, companies are trying to uh, avail the low cost labor they are trying to cut, uh, cut the cost and in in order to do so they are trying to use the cheap labor uh, to uh, to avail this cheap labor they are shifting their production unit or they are doing fdi in china this is the first thing mm -hmm. the second thing is these from china is a big market big big market highest populated country in the world and like Ch India, the second highest populated country in the world, these countries are the big market for those multinational firms. In order to uh, stay in that market or cater in the customer in that market, to enter in those markets, they are producing their products in those markets as well. That's why they are doing FDI there and they are selling their products in those markets as well. Okay. Graphically, how we present the patterns of FDI. This is the one exhibit uh, which shows the uh, uh, patterns of FDI in, bil in US billions of dollars and uh, over the period of uh, 1982 to 2008. As we see this, uh, this, uh, this diagram that from 1982 to uh, 1998, we see a gradual increase of FDI from uh, during this period, from 1982 to 1997. And we can say that uh, all of a sudden we are seeing, experiencing, we are observing a, s a sudden jump in 1999, 2000. We are observing a significant jump, and later on we are again observing the jump uh, from 2005 onward. What was it? How we explain this sort of sudden jump? Important thing is that uh, in 1999, 1999 and 2000, this sudden jump is uh, attributed is uh, attributed to the economic reforms in emerging economies in China and India. And because of the huge demand, demand is increase of those products, and uh, companies were going in the India and China, and financial reforms started in India in 1991, and the results of and uh, similarly in China 1994, the results of these financial reforms started to appear in late 90s, like in this period as we can see the 1999 and 2000. In the late 90s, we are observing the outcome of those financial reforms. Then we see the uh, decline in 2002 and 3, which is was which, and especially 2003, which was the financial crisis period in the, especially the Europe and the USA. Then again, we, uh, uh, in 2001, China joined the WTO, and after that, all this, this um, inc increment of 2004, 5, 6, 7, 
this is all contributed to India and China and Brazil and Russia, the emerging uh, emerging economies, because of the uh, participation in uh, participation of emerging economies mm -hmm. in outward FDI in FDI, uh, both inward and outward FDI in uh, participation in FDI. This this uh, surge has been observed. If we talk about if we divide like we are we were again we are continuously we are discussing the uh, the contribution of developing and developed economies in FDI uh, and uh, here uh, we can see the uh, their separate contribution sep separately of uh, developing nation and developed nations uh, in from 1995 to 2008 as we can see that in 2000 the uh, first we talk about the developed countries mm -hmm. if we see the contribution of developed countries it's going up till uh, 2000 in 99 and 2000 it's g it went up and after that they had experienced the financial crisis and it, it went down till 2006 then it went up again uh, in 2007 but on the other hand if we see the developing the FDI of developing countries is we are experiencing that uh, since 2002 to 2008 we are experiencing a, a gradual increase from 2002 to 2008 and important and do not forget that into 2001 2001 is the period when China joined the uh, WTO and from that point on uh, uh, the scholars believe that uh, uh, sh uh, the pattern of FDI changed suddenly Again, now the pattern of FDI is in terms of uh, gross fixed capital and uh, uh, in gross fixed capital mean in terms of fixed assets, um, investment in terms of fixed assets across the countries. Mm -hmm. Again, they have divided, I uh, mean, this, pic uh, this uh, figure divided the FDI in terms of developing, developing nations. We see the similar trend that, uh, like, but important thing is the difference between the developing and developed countries is is not that much. And in certain years, developing countries are doing more percentage of gross fixed asset investment compared to developed countries. As we can see in 1992 to 97, 98. Uh, 2001, 2003, 4, 5, 6. These year, in these years, the contribution of developing country is higher in uh, in FDI of gross fixed capital as compared to developing countries. The significant difference is uh, in two th year 2000, where the contribution of developed countries is uh, larger compared to the developing countries. Okay, what is the source of F foreign direct investment? Since World War, World, World War II, the U.S. has been the largest source of country. I mean, source of uh, FDI, I mean, who is producing this FDI, foreign direct investment? Which countries? In, in, in the early, early years after World War II, the U.S. has been the largest source country of FDI. The United Kingdom and, and the rest of the European countries uh, were the another source of uh, important FDI. Together, these countries account for the 56% of all FDI outflows from 1998 to 2006 and 61% of the total global stock of FDI in 2007. This is the sources of FDI across the countries. Now we are talking about across the countries. Country, these countries are only the developed countries and in terms of in US dollars, in billion, billion of US dollars. The highest contributor of FDI is United States, then United Kingdom, and then France, and then Germany, and then Netherlands and Japan. Okay, why do firms choose acquisition? Uh, they acquire uh, rather than uh, uh, producing or installing new facilities. Uh, acquisition, merger and acquisition versus the greenfield investment why they prefer greenfield investment compared to the merger and acquisition. Most cross-border investment is in the form of merger and acquisition rather than greenfield investment. This is the first thing. 
کہ فرمز آر پریفرنگ مرجر اینڈ ایکویزیشن ایز کمپیئر ٹو دا گرین فیلڈ انویسٹمنٹ فرمز پریفر ٹو ایکوائر ایگزٹنگ ایسٹ بیکاز وائی دے وائی دے ڈو دیٹ دے آر تھری ریزنس وائی دے آر پریفرنگ مرجر اینڈ ایکویزیشن اوور گرین فیلڈ انویسٹمنٹ دے آر تھری ریزن دا فرسٹ ون از مرجر ایکویزیشنس آر کوئکر ٹو ایگزیکیوٹ دین گرین فیلڈ انویسٹمنٹ دس دا فرسٹ تھنگ کوئکر ٹو ایگزیکیوٹ مین دے آر دے مین دے آر گوئنگ ٹو میک اے جوائنٹ وینچر آر دے آر گوئنگ ٹو جسٹ ایکوائر that uh, production facility in some way or product in certain part of that company somewhere and it will be more quicker they have to just negotiate some terms and conditions and and they, it will be more executed uh, more quicker rather than if they are doing the greenfield investment they have to apply for that thing they have to concede and the trade barriers and the contract between the countries and they have to pass the Uh, pass that uh, that their request to uh, to install new production unit and there are a lot of things they have to see there are a lot of processes they have to consider and they have to see the trade barriers uh, as well uh, while on the other hand margin acquisition they have it's more quicker and execute green film it is easier and perhaps less risky for a firm to acquire desired asset than to build them from the ground up second point is less risky that's true the it's less risky because the firm is that firm which they acquire or they acquire entirely or uh, partially that firm is already executed are running in that market they are doing business and they are doing good something and of course it's less risky compared to if they start from from nothing uh, there is nothing on the on the ground and they uh, they start from scratch from nothing it will be more risky to put the money and it will be more costly as well Firms believe that they can increase the efficiency of a acquired unit by transferring transferring capital, technology, and management. Why they do that? They believe that uh, if firm is not doing good and they acquire that firm, or if they f- acquire some part of the com- entire firm, they believe that uh, they can improve the production. They can uh, through the capital by investing more capital in w- or using higher technology. or using the higher management skill uh, uh, in that company by using these resources they can improve the efficiency of that company why does fdi in services occur this is the next point uh, that fdi is shifting away from uh, extractive industries and manufacturing and towards services important thing is another sh- another distinguishing feature in fdi in recent years is that fdi is ha- is occurring in not only in the manufacturing industries or uh, ext- extractive industries like mining or coal they are all firms are also doing fdi in service industry service industries mean uh, hotel uh, restaurants this sort of things the shift to services is because the general move in many developed countries towards services this is the general move this is the first point second thing i mean general trend the second point is the fact that many services need to be produced where they are consumed mean the if the market the the market of those firms are like for instance if the company companies uh, us companies market is they are producing something in and they are selling that product in china of course rather than selling from the usa it's better to 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 do the fdi in china and produce that stuff in china and sell in china that's more uh, more uh, more feasible thing this the next point is the liberalization of policies governing fdi in services i mean fdi policies I mean liberalization or the regulation regarding the service industries are changed in recent year that's why we see a new trend on uh, more more amount of fdi in service sector the next point is rise of internet based global communication okay this is the main computer main determining factor of of this change that the because of the advent of the this technology and the new latest technology it's very easy for firms to uh, conduct the services fdi across the countries does fdi always involve only manufacturing we have already discussed this uh, this point that uh, no fdi also involve the service sectors 
Over the last 20 years or so, there has been a shift away from some of the traditional industries like manufacturing or extraction industries towards FDI in services. In 2006 only, about two-thirds of the stock of FDI was in services. That's an unbelievable figure. There are four main reasons for the shift. We have discussed few of them. There is a general trend, like we discussed. The second thing is services often the produce where they are mm, consumed. After all, you cannot ship a hot latte from Seattle to Beijing. The third point, like we said, the liberalization policies of the governing services, of the governing services, uh, like Brazil opened its telecommunication sector to foreign companies in 1990s. The finally, the inter-based, internet-based global communication now allow companies to shift their equities to, like call centers, to low-cost economy locations like ch India and China. Why choose FDI over exports or licensing or other mode of uh, internationalization? The first one, why companies choose FDI over export? The first one is they are producing goods at home and then shipping. What is export? Producing goods at home and shipping them away to the another market. This is the export. But uh, co companies prefer FDI over export because export can be limited by transportation cost and trade barriers. These are this is the important uh, implication of uh, limitation of export that it incur extra cost and there are trade barriers because of that the trade barriers might be the export will be limited or restricted with, uh, with that country. The next point is FDI may be a response to actual or threatening trade barriers such as import tariff or quota. Okay, come because as we had discussed in the previous lectures that the companies or governments can impose trade barriers or quotas uh, of that quantity uh, of, uh, of uh, on export products to avoid those things or uh, avoid those uncertainties firms prefer to adopt FDI mode. The next one is a licensing. Licensing is the granting a foreign entity the right to produce and sell the firm's product in return for a loyalty royalty fee on every unit that the foreign entity sells. This is the second point. Then rather than uh, why they do that why companies prefer licensing or mm, prefer FDI over licensing. Internationalization theory, which is also known as uh, market imperfection theory, suggests that licensing has three major drawbacks. The first one is a firm could give away valuable technical know-how to a potential foreign competitor. Uh, like how we explain this thing, that when the company allow other firms in the foreign market to, uh, to use his technology, and sell their products, what happens that uh, in fact they are giving away their technology to that new, that foreign firm as well. Like it happened RCA, U, which was a US firm, licensed its color technology to Japanese firm, to Sony, to produce this, uh, they, they transferred this technology to Sony that and allowed them and provide them, give the license to them, to them that they can produce the color TVs in Japan and sell them. And in, in return, the, the RCA was getting the uh, royalty fee. But in fact, what happened later on, uh, the Sony absorbed, learned this technology and they started to produce that product by themselves. Might be after the expiration of the license, they started to produce that pro these TVs by themselves and started to uh, um, and starting to sell in the Japanese market, but later on they even enter in the U.S. market as a competitor of RCA, and that's why the market capitalization of the Sony is much higher as compared to the RCA nowadays. The second point is does not licensing does not give a firm the control over manufacturing, marketing, and strategy in the foreign country. This is the another important point that in the foreign country, when the firm choose to do the licensing, uh, provide license to other firm, they cannot control the uh, manufacturing processes, they cannot control the marketing, they cannot st control the strategy in, in, in that. I mean, they can, uh, overall, they cannot control the quality of the products, the, uh, the marketing strategy, the level of the marketing, quality of marketing and they cannot control the overall strategy of the firms. 
this is the, ne the second drawback. The next drawback is firm's competitive advantage may be based on its management, ma marketing and manufacturing capability. Like very famous example is the German and uh, Japanese firms like Toyota they have their man they are com they have competitive advantage in their management and process capabilities which was embedded in the organizational culture management and process capabilities and these capabilities of course firms cannot give the license to other firms that you can use the, you can replicate the same uh, management and process capabilities in that firm the firms cannot do that of course these things th these are not possible to do uh, rather than a Toyota, Toyota they cannot do this sort of thing or German firms they, they the only choice th they are left with is the uh, FDI internationalization theory suggests that exporting has two major drawbacks compared to FDI transportation cost as we discussed and the trade barriers okay this is the uh, uh, small case study of uh, Walmart that how Walmart entered in the, the uh, how, what was the operation of uh, Walmart and how they entered in the foreign market in the beginning uh, and we can but what, what, what is the intention of doing this case study is that we are going to see the trade pattern of FDI uh, of this Walmart how they expanded their business and uh, why didn't they do just the, the licensing or franchise and why they preferred to choose the FDI mode and what sort of markets uh, they choose and the location why they selected those countries as their first uh, target of FDI these are the different things uh, we can learn from this, um, this case study and like in the quick summary of this case study is that they were really successful um, uh, retailer in the US later when they were really uh, in the in the 1991 when they uh, when they noticed that might be they were not uh, uh, the growth opportunities are limited in the US market they should explore the other markets and at that time of course the, their competing uh, competitive firms were also going abroad and they that was a general trend like uh, as we have seen in the graph in the in the figures uh, before that the in from 1991 uh, uh, there was a, some change of pattern of FDI across the world across the across the countries and Walmart also uh, uh, realized that they should uh, move abroad to uh, try new markets and in, in doing so they uh, they think about to go decided to uh, expand its operation outside the United States and build a global brand the companies concluded the competitive advantages their competitive advantages lies in the combination of culture and sporting in some sporting information system that they have they have the information system such as the culture and the uh, and the systems uh, they have the information system which was connected with their uh, retailers and their all the stores across the country and uh, it was so quick and so rapid and dy dynamic uh, information system that the uh, suppliers they immediately know the demands within the stores and they automatically apply, will supply those products in the in, in the required quantities and and they uh, when they were deciding to move out of that country they realized that they cannot uh, license uh, and it's very difficult to do the licensing uh, and uh, give the their name their brand name to the other com companies and uh, they cannot do they cannot control this information system they cannot those companies might cannot replicate this uh, information system what they do they because this is the, uh, and the second thing was their management style that uh, which was really a competitive advantage they have in their management style but rather than what they they they, they uh, did the FDI in the neighboring they started with the neighboring countries they did with the Canada Mexico uh, Brazil uh, and uh, uh, like uh, specifically 42 uh, 402 stores in the uh, they have uh, 144 stores in Canada 13 in Puerto Rico which is in Central America and uh, Argentina Bra nine, 9 in Argentina 8 in Brazil 3 in China the and three in Indonesia these were their expansion 
as a part of their entry strategy once they established the, and they acquired a store in the foreign country and then they opened in the Germany as well. Overall strategy is that they, they, they first entered in the uh, closing market, neighboring markets and then they expanded to the uh, subsequent uh, with the other markets in the other markets as well. What you have to think about that how and why and uh, this is a really interesting case study and details of this case study is uh, provided here. You guys can read the whole case study later on. Okay, this is the summary of uh, today's lecture. Uh, the first thing that we had discussed that the foreign direct investment uh, the foreign direct investment is uh, occurs when a firm invests directly in a new facilities to produce or market in a foreign country when firm does this activity it's considered a multinational enterprises enterprise FDI can be uh, can be taken in the form of greenfield investment or merger and acquisition. Greenfield investment is establishment of a wholly new operation in a foreign country while merger and acquisition is the acquisition or merger with the existing firm in a foreign country. Flow of FDI refers to the amount of FDI undertaken over a given period of time. The stock of FDI refers to the total accumulated value of foreign owned assets at a given time. Gross fixed capital formation the total amount of capital invested in factories, stores, office mean total inv investment or FDI in terms of fixed assets. FDI has grown rapidly across the, uh, rapidly uh, than world trade and world output mean FDI the rate of increment rate of increase of FDI is higher than the rate of increase in GDP rate of increase of world growth. Firms still fear the threat of uh, the reason the firms still the threat of protectionism. Uh, democratic political institutes and free market economies have encouraged FDI. The globalization is for forcing firms to maintain a presence around the world. There are several reasons for this pattern. Firms are worried about the protectionism, protectionist measures, and the CFDI as a way of coming out changes in the economic and political policies around the world. The third one, many firms see the world as a market market now and expanding wherever they feel the market and wherever they, it makes sense. And the fourth one is that many manufacturers are expanding its foreign countries to take advantage in the low cost labor like in China and the third world countries. Firms prefer to acquire existing assets because mean firm, why firms prefer uh, merger and acquisition compared to FDI. These are the three regions. Merger and acquisition are quicker uh, uh, and the second one is easier and perhaps less riskier. The third one is firms believe that they can increase the efficiency of an acquired unit by transferring capital, technology and management skills. And licensing, why firms prefer FDI over licensing because of the trade barriers to overcome the trade barriers and the uh, and overcome the quotas or some sort of tariffs. International theory suggests that the licensing has the three, uh, three major limitations. The first one is the firm could give away the valuable technological know-how to potential foreign competitors like what happened with the RCA when they uh, the television, color television manufacturer when they went to the Japan. The second one is the, does n uh, the licensing does not give a firm the control over the manufacturing, marketing and strategy in the foreign country. This is the second point, the second drawback of the, uh, the licensing. The third drawback of the licensing is the firm's competitive advantage may be based in its management, uh, marketing and uh, uh, manufacturing capabili capabilities like we can uh, take the example of the Toyota and e even we in that case study like we had discussed this thing the Walmart the competitive advantage of the Walmart is it's their culture and they can and the sh uh, information system and they cannot license those things to the another country uh, to the other firms in other countries mean they can they, they know that and they, they realize this thing that the their management style or man uh, their process capabilities cannot be replicated by other firms these were the three major uh, drawbacks of the licensing. That's why firm pr prefer to do the FDI compared to the licensing. In the next lecture, we are going to see 
the sub, what are the impacts of this FDI on the home country and what are the impacts of this FDI on the host country and then we are going to see how trade theories can explain this FDI and how to what extent the, the, uh, these theories can explain the new trend of this FDI these are the things we are going to do inshallah in the next lecture thank you for today Allah Hafiz